All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Different Brain Speaker Series installment for October um, called Autism and Dating. My name is Mike Nickus, and I'm a team member at Different Brains, and I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, this webinar will have closed captioning generated by otter.ai. Um, these can be controlled using the CC button on your Zoom dashboard. We'll start in just a minute. But first, my fellow intern, Michael, is going to share some information about Different Brains. Uh, Michael, go ahead and take it away. Thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Tallsred, and I'm an intern at Different Brains, and I want to tell you a little bit about our organization. Different Brains is a nonprofit that strives to encourage understanding and acceptance of neurodiversity. Our mission has three pillars. One, to mentor neurodiverse adults and maximize their potential for employment and independence. Two, to increase awareness of neurodiversity by producing media. And three, to foster the new generation of neurodivergent self-advocates. Here at Different Brains, we promote awareness through the production of a variety of neuro, uh, neurodiverse media content, including our multiple web series, blogs, podcasts, movies, and documentaries, all available for free at differentbrains.org. All of our content is worked on by those in the mentorship program, through which we aid individuals in taking the first steps towards achieving their goals and finding their voice. To find more information or to make a tax deductible donation, please visit our website at differentbrains.org. Back to you, Mike. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, before we start, I wanna invite everybody to send questions uh, using the Q&A feature um, in Zoom or uh, excuse me, by putting questions in the chat box. And now I'm gonna hand it over to our moderators for this evening, Lyric Holmans and J.R. Reed. Hi humans, this is Lyric. I am a pale uh, non-binary human with short green hair and glasses. I'm wearing a red t-shirt today and I'm sitting here in an RV with uh, brown wood paneling and a window with the lines pulled shut behind me. And I've got big giant headphones over so that we hopefully don't get background noise feedback in here. Uh, I run the Neurodivergent Rebel blog if I look familiar to any of you. Uh, and my, as I said, I'm Lyric and I use they, them pronouns. Oh, it's late in the day. This is going to be exciting. <laughs> JR. Oh, goodness. You want to introduce yourself really quickly? <laughs> Pass it off. So, my name is JR. And yeah, I love doing things with Lyric because Lyric is coming from a RV in Texas, and I am at a log cabin in the Missouri Ozark. So <laughs> we're both we're both just you know in great places. Um, I am a writer, podcaster, speaker. Uh, not weird, just autistic, and I do some work with different brains. And I'm just very excited to be doing this once again. So let's uh, let's start at the upper left corner, like if we're doing a game show. Uh, Marcel, you want to say hi? Hi, my name is Marcel or Marcy Champy, and my author's name is Samantha Kraft, and I am in a red shirt sitting in a fairly dark room in the Pacific Northwest of Olympia, Washington. We're sandwiched between um, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle. For those of you who don't know the area, it's the capital of Washington in the Western United States. And I'm not sure how much I should share, so I will say that I am a Senior Manager of DEI at Ultranauts Inc., which is an engineering firm in the United States with 75% autistics. And I'm an author and an advocate and a, a friend and supporter of many. All right, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Gravino. I am an extremely pale, redheaded female wearing a lovely, dazzling purple dress and a red sweater. Uh, I have behind me the Birth of Venus by Botticelli, which is very fitting for my appearance. Um, I'm coming to you, thank you, Miranda Key, I love you. I'm coming to you from Montclair, New Jersey, just outside of New York City, about 25 minutes or so. And I am an autism sexuality advocate and I'm a relationship coach in the Wrecker Center for Adult Autism Services and also a writer and very happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce this right, make sure more Nikkei. That's close. Actually, that sounds really like romantic and nice, but, <laughs> but it's Marenna K. Marenna and so um, I am a tall, pale, blonde, just kidding. That is such a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an average height, dark skin, um, I guess, female presenting, non-binary, a woman with long black extension braid thingies. Um, who is very envious of Amy's um, background. It looks phenomenal, but, but I like mine because my BFF gave me this and my kids made that. 
But anyway, it's a picture behind me of some like scenic landscapes and then of a quote that I say a lot. I'm in a black either leather or faux leather chair. I'm wearing a black and white shirt and I'm coming to you from Hades, AKA Texas, where they love to steal people's <laughs> autonomy. But anyway, Lyric and I are not even gonna go there right now. <laughs> That's a whole podcast to itself, a whole webinar to itself. Um, I am a um, multiple ne um, neurodivergent, I'm a autistic adult. Um, I was diagnosed in adulthood. Um, um, I have two young children. Well, I guess they're not that young anymore. My youngest two children are autistic and my other children are have multiple disabilities and neurodivergences as does my spouse. So we're just kind of like team neurodiverse squad up in here. I do writing, um, speaking, educating, um, still trying to kind of find myself and figure my life out. And so grateful to be here with you all talking about the lovely topic of dating. And everything's finer in Carolina, right, Tony? Yes, it's beautiful here. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, and um, I've been working with folks on the spectrum for 30 years, actually over 30 years now. And um, interesting, I'm a late diagnosed autistic. Um, I came to realizing that the reason I worked with autistic people and had success with them was because um, this is my tribe. And I understood because I was living the same experiences as the people I was working with. So uh, I'm a professional, I, I, I write, and uh, I'm a mother of three neurodivergent kids, and I'm a professional. So I come at this from three different ways, parent, professional, and, and self-advocate. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you beautiful people. Oh, Eric, I think the one thing we're gonna ask is that we all try to put our ADHD aside tonight and try oh, to keep gosh. our answers to the topic short so we can do them. <laughs> I think I feel like that's mostly pointed at me because I, I'm no. long-winded, but it, I, it, it could be the rest of us too. Oh, it's just, uh, we we have a lot to cover today. We've been really we're really ambitious, like with all the things we've thrown in here that we're going to like try to get to, and we'll see if we can get through all of it. Uh, I think we're they're trying to keep us like a minute per person per response, so we want to make sure everyone does get a chance uh, to get through these. Uh, but I guess if that if that is the case, Jr. Help me, help me hold us all accountable. Uh, we'll jump right in and we'll, we'll pass these around. Uh, you know, I, I'm honored to be in the presence of so much wisdom today. So I feel like we've got the perfect uh, group of people here to, to talk about this. Uh, so, you know, we want to talk about, you know, relationships and defining different relationships and finding what relationship works best for you. Because, you know, for all of us, what relationship works well for me is not going to be what works well for you or anybody else. It's very unique and individual. You know, I, 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 my relationships are by no means you know, traditional. I'm a polyamorous person. So just by, by nature, that's like a different box with, you know, someone who is very monogamous. We might not be very compatible with one another because we have different relationship needs. So, you know, I'd love to throw this around and I see Tony nodding a lot. And so I kind of feel like I want to throw this one to Tony uh, to see if Tony has advice first. Uh, and then we'll let anyone else who wants to also chime in with what they say about advice for finding the relationship, the type of relationship or relationship that works right for you. As a That's hard for us. Yeah, I, I think the first thing is to recognize that compatibility is absolutely 100% crucial. And I think a lot of times, um, those of us on the spectrum tend to get into relationships by something called propinquity, which means, oh, that person's here, so I'm going to be in a relationship with them. And that is not the basis of a healthy and good relationship. Um, I love Lyric, but I'm very monogamous. That's not a good fit. So we will be great friends, but I, to get my needs met, I need to be with somebody who has that monogamous kind of a, um, a desire as well. And so when we are not compatible, that's where we have rifts. And then we try to make it work and we sell our souls to, you know, trying to be something we're not and expecting unrealistic things from other people. Uh, so, can I, in, unless someone's volunteering to go next, I'm going to call on somebody. You know, Larica, I'll just say that, you know, with you being very non-traditional, I think I'm the poster child for traditional in being a white heterosexual male. 
Oh, I know. Nobody likes you. No, I'm joking. Well, I, actually, actually that, that's true. They, they don't, but I don't think it's because of I think there's lots of other reasons. <laughs> You know, and wow. I thought about this the last couple of days, and I wrote a piece today for an online magazine about autism and dating. And I think what I've really found is it's taken a long time, and I just crunch all the data from past relationships at what worked and what didn't work, and the good parts and the bad parts. And I, I put all that data together into what I'm looking for and, you know, using in my current relationship. Yeah. And see, we all have these different approaches. To me, I'm like, oh, that's too much data. But it probably is like a very practical way to like look at this because it's like instead of sometimes when I lead with maybe not necessarily logical thinking in a relationship where it gets me into trouble. So that might have saved me at one point. Um, Amy, did you have anything you want to say? I, I'm almost 56 oh. years old and this is the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> oh. It's not my history. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, you know, I am 100% okay with polyamory if that's what somebody is, is up for and what they're into. My issue is that I could just about deal with having my heart broken by one person. I don't think I could survive having it broken by two. And I, and I am almost certainly the one who would probably get hurt knowing myself, knowing my nature to just be, you know, when I have feelings for somebody, it's kind of an all the way thing. I can't have just a little bit of feelings for someone. And so I'm, I always seem to be the one who ends up being more vulnerable and and getting hurt, and so I and I I literally I don't I don't think I could handle a polyamorous relationship myself. But again, if it works for other people, gods and goddesses bless them. More power to you. I just I have enough issues with one person, let alone multiple. So that's my stance anyway. Yeah, and and just like so, everyone just make sure I know we all. Uh, get thrown off that so the question just again because we've got a couple more people and we've all answered it or several of them already you know talking about how you can find the best type of relationship that does work for you uh and i'd love to throw it at marina k if that's if you're ready for that one marina k sure why not <laughs> okay so i'm gonna be like the worst type of panelist because like even the little questions that people are typing in i'm thinking okay well it depends on this and depends on that so that's kind of like what i think too because like what would have been the the best kind of relationship for me five years ago or 10 years ago or whatever, you know, it, things aren't necessarily the same and it, it varies from person to person. I, I think one thing is first, I think you need to know what it is that maybe you might not know exactly what you want, but you need to know what you don't want. I think, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so that you, you know, I, and I think you have, need to have a kind of a sense of yourself and I think you need to um, have some respect for yourself. And I'm not saying you can't be, working through your issues. So we're always going to be a work in progress. We're always going to be kind of jacked up, but I think you need to be on the way because I think that, um, you can attract, you know, or be, you know, I guess vulnerable to manipulators or, you know, narcissists or users or whomever. Um, if, you know, sometimes, you know, with those that, you know, in relationships. So I think that, You've got to, you know, people talked about compatibility, you know, so I think about like it, what's important to you? Is it, you know, conversation? Is it, you know, physical attraction? Is it stability? Is it, you know, um, you know, is, is there anything in particular? Is it a family? Is it sex? Is it, um, you know what I mean? Like what's the thing or the things that you need and what do you bring to the table and what does the other person bring and what kind of relationship are you, is this, you know, are you settling? Is this like forever or is this for now? <laughs> or is this, you know, like what season of your life are you in? I think ultimately you, you want to be authentic. I think when people are being fake, you're going to get fake back, you know, ultimately. Um, and I just don't think that it benefits anyone. I think that whether it's a real relationship, hookup, whatever, people just need to be real with one another, you know, and real with themselves. And I think that um, that authenticity goes a long way. Awesome. Now, um, Marcel, do you have anything to add? I'm going here on my list, like making yeah. sure I don't list anybody. <laughs> so I'm in my early 50s and I wasn't diagnosed till my early 40s. So I went through most of my dating history clueless, um, to say the least. I was raised by a free spirited hippie in California on the coast who took me to nude beaches. So I decided I was going to be a nun pretty much in, in my dating history, which did, that didn't turn out, but um, I became very confused by my early 20s where I was pretty much 
a puppy and not a human being, um, where please adopt me, I'll do anything to make you happy, please take me home. And I didn't have any boundaries, any rules of what I wanted or what I needed. I didn't even know what I liked or what I didn't like. I'm still learning what types of foods and colors and music I like at my age now. So I'm doing a lot of reprocessing. So it does depend a lot on the person's maturity, whether or not they're diagnosed or not, what season they're in that was mentioned. Um, for me now, it's I read something in a relationship book once that said, are they keeping their promises? Are they following through with what they say they're going to do? And time and time again, I would attract people that didn't have my best interest or our relationship's best interest in, at heart. And they would say things, they talk a nice talk, or they would lie, or they would manipulate. And I didn't realize with, the, with boundaries, what I understand now is I can say no, I don't have to have a reason. I can say, I don't like this. I can remove myself. I can break up with someone and I don't have to have a logical reason and, and proof or, or validate the other person. And I'm still learning those things. So all those kind of came through my mind when we're talking about this. And also now more so I understand what I need in a relationship. I very much need to physical, I need touch. That's very important to me. I need reassurance um, because I have PTSD and generalized anxiety disorder. So I know that I need someone with a lot of patience and a lot of understanding and a lot of wisdom and depth because I'm a very deep thinker. So knowing what I need is important and, and being matched with someone now, I'm in a relationship with an autistic person who can also acknowledge my strengths and my gifts and, and say those out loud to me and reinforce that they think I'm a beautiful person and, and we can reflect and be mirrors to one another. You are a beautiful person. <laughs> You're so awesome. I just wanna tell you that because I don't think we believe that about ourselves enough. Uh, all of you here are very awesome. I'm, I'm honored to be with all of you here. I feel like that leads us really perfectly into kind of our next topic, talking about boundaries. JR, do, do, you, do you agree? Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, when we're talking about boundaries, we're talking about physical and emotional boundaries, but also things like consent, uh, red flags that we find in relationships, things like that. So Amy, you want to start us off with that? Sure, sure. I saw somebody mention something about red flags, and I think one of the questions, I'm, I'm, everything is all blurring together right now. Um, I'm just trying to find the comment that someone made. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know where it was now. But um, the thing I always like to say is that when you have feelings for someone, when you have rose-colored glasses on, all the flags look red. So we as autistic people are, are as vulnerable to, to being influenced by our emotions as as anybody else, um, and and part of you know part of the idea of setting boundaries is also it also goes hand in hand with the idea of having standards. And for me, growing up, I never believed as an autistic person that I could have standards. That anybody who showed the slightest amount of affection or attention to me, I had to reciprocate because maybe nobody would ever want to date me again. Maybe nobody would ever want to have sex with me again if I messed it up. If I did something quote wrong. And so I didn't, I didn't even know what, what standards I had, what that, what that would look like, what that would mean. I had zero confidence. So, you know, if you don't think that you're a, a person, you know, who's worth respecting and worth treating in the right way, then you, you that will make it a lot harder, I think, to set a lot of those boundaries because you don't recognize that they're being maybe violated necessarily. It took me a long time to get to the place of, of, of recognizing that. Um, so it has to start, you know, from early on. I think I talk about this in the presentations that I give that setting boundaries starts when kids are, are young, when we're, you know, all too often we bring a kid to, okay, give, give grandma a kiss. So I don't want to kiss grandma too bad. You got to kiss grandma. What is that telling a child, telling them that their body doesn't belong to them, that whether or not they want to do something with somebody doesn't matter and it may seem like a little, little thing, but it's not, it's not a little thing at all. So that's, you know, it, it has to start from, from there because then when, when the person gets into a dating or relationship situation 10 years down the line, then they're not going to be able to set that boundary. They're going to think, well, it doesn't matter if I don't want to have sex with this person. That what I want doesn't really matter. So I'll just go along with it, even though it's not what I want. And, and yeah, and the manipulation is very easy to fall into. I've been there. I saw, I think it was Bilal who said something about it. somebody mentioned that they'd been manipulated. And that, that was the red flag comment about not recognizing red flags and then ending up being manipulated. I, yes, I've absolutely been there. Um, and and it's, it's a, the thing about manipulation is it's so hard to recognize when you're going through it 
especially when you have feelings for the person because you think this person's been so nice to me and they've been so great. How could they be a bad person? I couldn't see the, the potential and the reality of a, a, a person who'd been nice to me also being not such a great person after all. I couldn't understand that. It took me, it's even now, I still want to see the best in everybody. So it's, it's hard. It's, you know, the thing for all of you who are watching this to understand is that all of us here are still learning. None of us here are experts, right? We're, we're here before you to try to give you advice and help, but none of us are experts. And, and that's why I always am reluctant when I hear anybody use that word because it, it, it confers with it a static authority that can't be challenged. And we're learning so much all the time about dating and about autism. And so nobody knows everything. So I want you all to know that you're stumbling and figuring out we're stumbling and trying to figure it out too. So you're not alone. Yeah, and you know, I think, Amy, with me, my red flag problem was always just, like you said, the rose-colored glasses and, you know, not paying attention to them. But after my last relationship was over a couple of years ago, and I finally kind of got over that, I, I made a physical list of red flags that I've seen, not just in that relationship, but in past ones, and made it a real point before I got into my next one, you know, that I was going to actively look for those red flags and other red flags. And yeah. so far, you know, it's it's been very positive. But I will see how it keeps going. Yeah, JR, I, I love the list idea for all of these strategies we're talking about. Make lists for yourself about those things that you want and need in a relationship, those red flags, and 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 revise them over time. But I think, you know, another piece of that is we, a lot of us have such sensory issues that again, we don't know how things are supposed to feel. So we've got, you know, people saying, yeah, like Amy said, you know, let grandma, you know, kiss you and grab your cheek. But we're also out there in the world, really accosted day in and day out by sensory experiences. So we don't really have a baseline of feeling good. And that translates into difficulty into relationships. And I think that's important. That's very unique to those of us who have sensory issues. And, um, you know, neurotypical people are not dealing with that. Yeah. Uh, Marcel, what are what are your boundaries or things that you look for when it comes to boundaries? So I, I've learned off of a lot of painful experiences. When I was in my early 20s, I was dating a, a gentleman who's no longer with us. He, he's passed. Um, who I look for those red flags when I was younger, but I believed when people told me otherwise. So when I would confront someone, for instance, he used to, I'd go to his bedroom and everything would be moved slightly, all our photographs, the posters, the cards I'd made him. And I've said, why is everything rearranged? And he wouldn't tell me, but I found out later, you know, he had another girlfriend. So when she came, he rearranged everything. And this was the same um, gentleman who asked my husband, my um, father for hand in marriage. And then I found out later he was already married and in counseling with his wife. So there, there's a lot of deception. And even when I would see the red flags and confront people, I would still be lied to or manipulated. So for now, as an older, much older, much wiser woman, it's having professional people that I can turn to, whether that's a job coach or a therapist. And if I don't have a professional, then a support group or a very good friend or a relative whom I trust and asking them and, and saying, this is what's happening, what do you think? But I've also learned something about myself and self-awareness is a huge part of, of stating boundaries and make, keeping yourself safe, is I justify and I, and I make things better than they actually are. So even when I'm seeking out counsel and support, I, I'm not saying the complete truth. So I have to honor myself and tell the complete truth of what's happening in my situations and not be afraid of what other pre people are going to tell me and, and their advice. I'm still, I'm still very much um, 12 years old inside or 10 years old or five years old, whatever age, wanting to stay with someone, um, even if that means it's a risk to my own mental health or physical health. So I'm learning still at my age that I need to speak my truth to myself and to other people and not only look for the red flags, but ask people, are these red flags? And, and what do you think? And, and give the complete picture. Yeah, uh, Marina Kay, I'm not sure if you're stimming or asking us to come to you. <laughs> oh. It's all, it's all good, we all do it. I got, I got my fidget spinner right here. <laughs> so um, 
yeah, and so I was just simming. But um, I, I think that a lot of things have been shared that make a lot of sense um, that because on one end, one can be cautious, then you can be so cautious and so overprotective that you don't allow yourself to have experiences. So the person who made the, you know, I think it was you, Marcel, and someone in the comments talking about both red and green flags. I think that we can miss red flags quite a bit, you know, like Amy said about, you know, kind of looking at things, you know, in a particular way with rose colored glasses, you know, and, and believing people say what they mean, what they say and say what they mean and are what they project themselves to be. But I think also um, because of the differences in social cues or because of things that we've been through, or, you know, just because of the vulnerability of, you know, of being, of, you know, dating or being in a relationship or, you know, meeting people can be challenging. Um, I think we can sometimes miss someone who's like hello <laughs> interested you know <laughs> and so um so I think that we do kind of have to it really kind of each context is different um and try to just you know I think we're gonna have to try to understand that it makes me think about when you're if you're walking or driving or riding something you know like the ground might look level but is it really level is there like a deep you know, crevice that you can't see, or is it just a little shallow bump, or is it muddy and it just, but it looks like it's dry, you know, kind of, I think like, you know, all of these things are like that. You can, you can, to a point, try to um, prepare or be aware, but ultimately some of it, you don't know until you're, you know, in the wild. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and I'll say, I think one of, you know, on boundaries for me, I think one of the biggest green flags is someone who respects my boundaries, right? Because I didn't even learn to have boundaries until I, after I found out I was autistic and I was almost 30 when I found out I was autistic. And like one of my aha moments was when I was having this panic attack that was so bad that I literally couldn't speak for 30 minutes after it. Like I knew exactly what I wanted to say and my mouth wouldn't move. And it was because I was on the way to this holiday party I didn't want to go to for this mm -hmm. employer. And I was being so just doing what other people expected of me instead of doing, you know, things because I wanted to do it. And that was like, at that moment, I just kind of broke and was like, started asking myself, am I doing this because I really want to do this? Or am I doing this because somebody has this expectation I do this? Uh, because up until that point, a lot of things I had been doing were because of so many external expectations put upon me to where I thought my own wants and needs weren't valid and I was just you know giving to everyone else and do just it wasn't a happy existence I was a, I would it destroyed me being someone that gave and gave and what I thought was I was somehow you know giving in a way that was going to make those relationships better but really it didn't make those relationships better it actually you know it wasn't a service to anyone because I kind of resented those people for violating my boundaries but I was really not putting up much fight to put those boundaries up I was easily letting people violate my boundaries uh, and so I resented people violating my boundaries for because I wasn't being strong enough and saying this is my boundary no absolutely not and so it didn't do any good for the relationships at all. It made me miserable. It made you know me disconnected from the people around me in the workplace, and you know even in my personal life. Uh, and so it wasn't it wasn't very healthy to like feel like I can't safely express my needs. So you know talk about green flags. You know someone in the comments was asking about those. Someone who respects my boundaries. Someone that's willing to listen to me when I'm expressing my needs. A lot of it's going to be kind of polar opposites of the red flags really it's someone who does all of the 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 good things and, and isn't manipulating me isn't lying is 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 uh has has accountability you know when they make a mistake and I say hey you know that that really hurts because this and we can have a conversation about it and they're not going to make excuses and tell me I'm being too sensitive or you know any of that um because I don't need my feelings and my to be dismissed I've had enough of that my entire life and now that I know I'm neurodivergent I know that I'm like my experiences actually are what they are and so I'm not going to let anybody else do that to me anymore but still the manipulation that 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 could be like a whole thing on and off like trying to figure out when someone's manipulating you sometimes because that I think I think I know how to spot those manipulators and then I get manipulated again and it's like oh my confidence <laughs> Yeah, Lyric, why don't we move into communication uh, before we get to some questions? Yeah. All right. So thank you for keep keeping us moving on topic. So uh, the, the next thing we're going to try to talk about is really 
extremely important with relationships is communication. So, you know, I talked a little bit about being able to express those needs and uh, having a partner who listens is incredibly important, being heard, uh, you know, different kinds of communication, like is your partner uh, pulling away from you or, you know, things like that, that some of us may not necessarily pick up on because, you know, I actually didn't really learn that facial expressions meant anything until I found out I was autistic, believe it or not. Like, I'm, I feel like I... Like now I'm obsessed with it. Like, I'm like, oh my God, there's like a map. I didn't even know there was information there. You know, I could read dogs and I couldn't read people. I don't know how that happened, but you know, some of us, we don't necessarily pick those things up naturally. So those nonverbal things uh, or, you know, the nuances of oversharing or, you know, when do you share in a relationship and what do you keep private and you know respecting if someone's interested or figuring out if someone's even interested like I might not know if someone's hitting on me or not uh or if someone's actually not interested like are we pursuing someone that doesn't want to be pursued like all of these things are kind of a landmine for for neurodivergence especially I feel like dating neurotypicals is harder for me than dating other neurodivergent people Mm -hmm. um but I'd love to open it up to the wisdom of our panelists here to see if anyone has advice for handling communication in relationships because there are so many aspects of it uh, to consider and especially when you know we've got people who process uh differently lyric can i address that yeah tony i feel like that's right up your alley yeah i i actually think that this goes back to compatibility again um we don't we we're in a world that tells us we have to communicate with words that's the predominant uh, neurotypical way of communication but those of us on the spectrum have many different ways beautiful ways of communicating we can just sit in parallel play together and just be in the energy of each other we can stim together we're all stimming here together and that's a form of solidarity so when you're choosing somebody to date Choose somebody that gets your form of communication. Do you communicate through listening to music, through going to walks, pacing back and forth? All of these are completely legitimate forms of communication, which have been kind of beaten out of us. You know, we were told it's not okay to do echolalia, you know, sound normal, be normal. Um, And so I think we need to go back to how do we communicate best and then find those people who really honor and respect that in us and and get it, who understand how we communicate. And it doesn't have to be about forcing ourselves to use words. I mean, if you want to use words and you enjoy that and it works for you, great. But explore those other ways that you can communicate and look for those people who appreciate that and can communicate in the ways that are most native to you. You know, Tony, you and I have talked about this before, but the uh, painting over my shoulder in the blue frame was actually painted by a 12-year-old nonverbal autistic child. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's how that child wow. Yes. Not words. Nobody has to use no. words. To communicate, that painting says it all, and we can oh, all yeah. sit there and enjoy it, you know, without any words. So, yeah, uh, and that mind yeah. shift. Yeah, uh, you know, art, art, and music I think are kind of part of my language. And you mentioned having a partner that understands echolalia. Like my, my partner and I both have ec- are very echolalic, and we echo off each other a lot. So we have so much fun with that. But having someone who doesn't get that is like you know it it would just be a different ball game it wouldn't it wouldn't be as compatible um i want to keep us moving can i marcel all right can i throw it at you sure you can throw things at me preferably (laughs) dark chocolate free trade dark chocolate um i love what was said about communication that isn't just just words and i was thinking along the same lines for me, I'm very sensitive to energy, and I know a lot of autistic people are, have a lot of empathy. Some of us are empaths. I'm an empath. I used to actually serve as a steer. And so for me, what's important about communication is how I feel in the presence of that person. And that doesn't have anything to do with their body language sometimes or what's coming out of their mouth or what we like to do. It has to do with when they leave the room after we've been together for a half hour, an hour, do I feel depleted or I feel more energized? Do I feel supported or do I feel... Um, like there's something wrong with me. So I've really learned to start trusting that gut instinct I have when I'm around someone. And that's no different for if it's going to be a romantic partner. I visualize it and describe it as we all have a basket that we're carrying on our heads. 
And some people's baskets are just really heavy and filled with all these spiky objects and they hurt me. And then some people's baskets are almost empty. And it's so easy for me to live with my middle son. Um, he's off in, in another city right now, but when he lives here, I describe him as his basket being empty. When he enters a room, I feel light. I feel, don't feel burdened. I don't feel like I have to be someone other than myself. That's the first thing. And the second thing would be to be in a relationship where I'm not having to listen to three conversations at once coming out of one person's mouth. Um, what they mean, they're, they, what they're saying, what they really mean and what they want me to believe. And there's all these different levels of, of conversation going on where I've been in a relationship before. And I said, well, isn't this what you really mean? And they say, yeah. And I'm like, well, why didn't you say that? And they're like, well, I didn't want to hurt your feelings or I didn't want you to get you worried. And so I know for me, I need to be with someone who speaks on one line, not three different railroad tracks going three different directions. I need one line. Otherwise it becomes a exhausting for me to listen to them talk because I'm hearing what they're not saying and I need to be with someone where I'm hearing what they're saying and they're and they're saying the truth I need to be someone who speaks the truth oh gosh yes yes that that thing when there's an incongruence between what they're saying and their actions say something else that that throws me I guess that that should that should be one of those flags I should see uh I'm learning more to notice than what it is, but uh, it, it's an instant, er, something's wrong here. Um, can I throw it at Marina Kay? Awesome. Sure. So I, I really like a lot of the things that have been said. And um, truly for me, um, you know, just thinking about like my life and thinking about all the different relationships that I've been in, you know, and different you know, situations that I've been in ever, of every type from things that are, you know, every, you know, from the abusive relationship to the puppy love, to the friends with benefits, but you thought you were in a relationship to the all kinds of different things to the, you know, it, it was, it, it was, it worked out, but then it fizzled away. And then now, you know, I'm married, you know, to someone who understands me and gets me and everybody, you know, there's phases, there's periods of my life where, I realized that I wasn't being true to myself because society tells you that you're supposed to be a certain way. You're supposed to want a certain thing, you know, um, or you're supposed to want, you know, so whatever it is, if it's that you're supposed to want to be, you know, have, you know, settle down and be with someone, or you're supposed to want to be wild and free, or you're supposed to don't call them because you don't want to look too awkward or don't text right away or whatever, you know, all these little games. I'm not playing games at this stage in my life. And there's nothing wrong with it. Like there were times in my life where I wish I had been real with myself and realized, hmm, I was not emotionally ready to be in a relationship. I should have just either got a, a battery powered friend or hooked up because I just wasn't there. You know what I mean? But that wasn't something I would tell my, I would allow myself to, to realize, you know, and sometimes it's all right to be alone. And you know, it's just, it's better, frankly, it's, it's pretty really good to be alone, frankly, than rather than be in a bad situation. But, um, for me, I, communication is so key. I need somebody who I can be real with. I need to be able to be real authentic me all the time. I need to be, um, me that's, that's in pain and needs you to hear me and feel me. I need you to be there. Me that's, excited about something and you're trying to figure me out and get me I need to be all of me I don't need to only be the best me or just the neediest me for you um I need to be able to feel comfortable with you and um I know that you have my back and that I have yours and not be scared and um and know that even the things that you don't really there aren't your thing you know about me because I'm me they, they come with the package you know all of those things are important and I think that whatever a person is doing you know, the, the analogy I loved about, do you feel drained? And I think a person definitely taken in context because sometimes like I have children, I love them, but oh, do they drain me? So sometimes the person is not bad for you. They just kind of can be a little bit much. <laughs> so, um, so, but ultimately, how do you feel not just when you're with them, but when you're away from them? Is this person, you know, if you think about, um, there's this book I read once that talked about deposits, emotional deposits you make in people like a, you know, a bank account or what have you, or, or a credit card. And, you know, my mother has had credit cards 
um, canceled. And she was like, I don't understand why they canceled my card. I never use it. I'm thinking, exactly. You have a $10,000 or $5,000 balance and you don't use it. Or you buy one thing for $30 and you pay it off. You're not making them any money. They don't want you. You know I mean, so it's like, you know, um, people want, you know, transactional things in life. But I mean, we want it, but the transactions need to be intrinsic, not just like, what do you do for me? But how do we, how are we good people by being together? How am I my best, you know, you know, myself, my real self and you're your real self. You know what I mean? Um, how am I growing as a person in your presence? And you are too, you know, that we're not tearing each other down or pulling each other apart in some kind of way. And, um, and those are all things. And then even with all that, everything doesn't work. Like what I taught my children is, um, I, from the time that they're very little, statistically, so you have a crush on whoever, right? Statistically, y'all aren't going to be together. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I mean, most likely you're, this is your age. This is the, the blah, 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 blah. There, you might be the exception. And if that's the case, great, but you probably won't. So look at this with an understanding is that like, just like almost everything else probably has an expiration date. You don't eat something past the expiration date. And it's not because you don't like it. It's because it's no longer healthy for you. And so, but it, again, but be open, you know, to the possibility, but just also be realistic about what your, what the expectations are. If you're flipping a coin, you should, you know, that has a heads and tails, then you shouldn't be expecting to have a triangle when you flip it. There is no option for a triangle. You need to know what, what the possibilities are and yeah. act accordingly. Yeah, Lyric, we got word from on high that we need to move on to the questions. So oh. Amy, we will let you start the next topic, I promise. <laughs> so Mike, what do we have? All right, so let's open up with a question um, that quite a few people are curious about um, from Sue in our chat, actually. Um, do you have any advice for someone who wants to start dating but doesn't know how to start? Amy, why don't you take that? <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes, throw that one at me, sure. Um, <laughs> I, I was trying to be nice as you get to talk about the last one. <laughs> yeah, and I had a good answer for that one, too. I was, like, totally prepared. Um but actually, what, what some of what I had in mind can apply here too. Um, I often say that I have not yet found somebody who knows the toast part of me. And the toast part of me is that I eat toast with butter only at home. And I eat toast with jelly only when I'm out like in a hotel or, or somewhere that's not home. Because the brands of butter vary out there in the world. And I don't like butter that's not the butter I like. Nobody's been around long enough yet to know the toast part of me. And that's kind of become my barometer for like, you know, earlier when Marcel was talking, I can't even remember what she was saying, but I was starting to cry because thinking about some of this gets to me because I have often been the person who people have enjoyed having around for the short term and then not for the long haul. And there are a few things that make me feel more broken than that because I, I want to give somebody love. I do. And I think it's good. And I just don't seem to agree with it. And it hurts. It hurts terribly. And so no matter what you do, you are taking a risk. This is a risk. And that's not always a bad thing. The place you start is by deciding that you're somebody worth dating. You have to know that about yourself. You can't expect somebody to validate you. I know that's what we all look for. And that's what I looked for for the longest time. I thought I just need someone in my case, since I'm mostly heterosexual-ish, a guy to tell me that I'm attractive and I'm lovable. And, and what finally wound up happening was that I looked in the mirror and, and I told myself I like the person that I saw. Nobody could give that to me. And so if, if, if you're seeking that validation through a relationship, that's, that might not be leading you down the best path. You don't want somebody to, to make you in, into who you want to be. You want to be that person um, because then, you know, if that relationship ends, then, then what I, you, don't, you don't want to define yourself by who you're with. And I know it's easy to do that. Um, and I've, and I, I haven't defined myself who, who I've been with, but I have, you know, I open myself up fully when I care about someone and they, you know, to, to, to tell someone that I love them and to not have them say it back, which, has happened twice is, you know, it just makes me feel like I'm not going to find somebody. And, uh, but I don't, I, I'm not going to give up either. That's the thing is, is, I saw people talking about rejection in the chats and all, right? How do you make it hurt less? I'm sorry to tell you, rejection never hurts less. It absolutely never hurts less. But what makes it easier is knowing who you are. 
What makes rejection easier is knowing that that rejection doesn't define who you are. Okay, this person rejected me. I'm not going to let that determine who I think I am. I, it took me a long time. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you so much. Um, so, so you know, rejection is a, is, a, is a fact of life. Rejection is part of dating. That's always going to be the risk that you take. So, so I think that the, the, the number one thing I would say when you are trying to get started with this is to know that it may not end up the way that you hope it will that first time. The, the first person that you didn't, you know, the first boyfriend I had, I immediately said in my brain, we're either going to get married or we're going to break up. I was already thinking like all the way down to the extreme end. So it may not turn out to be whatever it is you are. You, you, you can't plan out a relationship necessarily. You can't, you know, that's, that's not how relationships work. And so you just have to know that even if it doesn't, even if that relationship doesn't turn out the way that you wanted it to, it doesn't mean there won't be another one. It doesn't mean there won't be another chance. Yeah. I am a failed pessimist. I always believe that there's another chance. So those are my thoughts. All right, Mike, what, what else we got? Uh, thank you, Amy, for, for sharing that. Um, yeah. so Sorry, I didn't mean to get weepy. No, no, <laughs> hey. Thank you for vulnerability. Seriously, no, don't apologize for being real. Hey, he, as a heterosexual male, I think you're attractive and lovable. So, thank you very much. Although I'm not going to date you because I'm already dating someone, but you know. That's totally okie dokie with me. <laughs> um, so another question um, from Nathan is, um, one impediment to relationships is ableism. Dating is hard when the other person expects you to be problem-free and able to do everything. What do you do? I'm sorry, what neurotypical is problem-free? <laughs> I, I don't think that's an autism thing. I think that's a people thing. See, I'm the wrong, wrong person to ask. I'll, I'll just say move on. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you see, and and I, I'm not trying to sound flippant because it's like, believe me, when I tell y'all, if I could just go through, I found an old journal of mine the other day. If I could, if I could sit y'all down, my my life has been a regular reality show. <laughs> so I, I've I've been in all kinds of you know horrifying, humiliating, um, exhilarating, every emotion that you can think of relationships. I know it's not easy, but um, ultimately you can only be who you are. And if, if who you are doesn't make wow them, they need to go. Yeah. That's just how I feel. I think if you don't have baggage or drama, you're probably three years old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else we got, Mike? All right, um, so another one. Um, I haven't dated at all in eight years. How do I make up for that lack of experience um, in sex and dating? I feel that I will fumble in both the bedroom and during dates. Can, can I just nervous? say, I, 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 I wanna jump in on this and say, you know, don't, don't worry about like lack of experience and like trying to stack up against other people. Don't compare yourself to other lovers and other partners just be really authentic, be really honest and be vulnerable. And somebody is gonna appreciate the fact that you haven't been out there everywhere. Some of us have been out there everywhere. There's nothing wrong with that for those of us who've been out there everywhere, but some of you, us haven't, and that's okay too. Uh, and, and there is no shame in that because you know, in, in a relationship, regardless if you're here with a new partner, it's going to be about communicating with one another your needs and what each of you want, uh, you know, in, in the different levels of your relationship, whether they are either romantic or intimate and, and so forth. It's going to be a lot of communication and learning together what your partner likes, because there's not really an expert out there about all of these relationships or, or intimacy or any of that, because what they may have had that they're, you know, someone who's been out there a lot has had their last five partners like may not be what someone else likes because everybody's cup of tea is different. So, you know, don't, don't let that scare you. Just be, mm -hmm. be yourself, be honest, be really authentic. Uh, I, I think there shouldn't be any shame in, in saying, you know, I haven't dated eight years, but I'm ready to get out there. Like, I think that's great that you're honest about that. I'd like to respond a little bit too. It's kind of a combination to the last two, if that's okay. Um, First of all, I think I've had experience and it, to me, it doesn't really make a difference because each person is so unique and their, their needs and their wants and what they're comfortable with and not comfortable with are, are so different. And I think in this age we're living in right now, 
that quirks and differences are a lot more acceptable than they were 10, 20 years ago. And that most of us are not just looking for sex and, and social norms. And if they are, that's not someone you wanna be with probably anyways, unless that's what you're looking for. I mean, if that's what you're looking for. Um, focusing not on what you're lacking or what you might not need, but what a lot of people have who have been through um, experiences similar to autistic people or, or those with neurological profiles that are similar, which is a lot of us have deep self-understanding, deep empathy. Um, most of us are, are, are deeply compassionate and resilient, focusing on those things that you can bring to a relationship and how you might um, bless, for lack of better words, someone with your, with your being instead of what you might mess up on um, it would be so refreshing if I was still dating, which I'm not, I'm in, in a very wonderful relationship, but to be with someone who, who just was quirky and, and confidence in that quirkiness and even transparent, hey, I haven't dated for eight years. I hope I'm not coming across as a goof. I mean, how refreshing that would be. Yeah, you know, Marcel, it's, it's funny. When I was driving to my first date with the person I'm dating now, I said to myself, you know, I really hope this is my last first date. Well, Mike, we're going to go on to the last topic right now and come back to you in a few minutes. Um, right. Why don't we talk about mindfulness? Lurk? Hi. Uh, so, you know, not mindfulness like meditation, like mindfulness in the way of in your relationship, being mindful of, you know, what are, um, you know, your own needs and, you know, how, how do you then, you know, say we talk about those difficult times when the relationship in you know, you have to deal with that part of taking care of yourself or, um, you know, some of us, I, I know I bring trauma into my relationship with me and sometimes my partner triggers my trauma and I trigger his trauma and we trigger each other's trauma. And so we have to be mindful of that with each other, uh, just those responses uh, and just all of those things that can be really hard and how like, you know, mental health um impacts you know how, how we are in relationships and being mindful of all of those things um so you know i'd love to throw that whoever's brave and bold and wants to say you know how they help deal with some of those harder parts you know breakups and you know closure and all, all of these 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 pieces that you know they're, they're not the easy pieces and there's a, you know some of the things that probably some of the questions here um people could really benefit from just judging by some stuff we didn't get to <laughs> oh yeah well, we haven't heard from tony in a while yeah, I, yeah, I'd actually like to address that because I think it's really important for those of us who are neurodivergent to recognize that we do handle trauma uh, differently than neurotypicals. We tend to, because of our sensitivities, because we're empathic, we tend to hold on to those things much longer than a lot of people. So you're going to hear people say, why don't you just get over it and move on? That was eight years ago. And we just don't, we are really stuck in our traumas. The way we're, our brains are wired, we tend to be very, you know, we can be very perseverative, we can be very stuck, and we're dealing with traumas from early childhood um, because of our life experiences. So this is something that we really need to be aware of, that what other people tell us may not be good advice for us just to get over it. If we could get over it and not be triggered in our relationships, then we would have already done that. So I just think it's really, really crucial to recognize that and to, in terms of mindfulness for that, our emotions are not bad. I hear a lot of people who, you know, are saying, well, I'm just so angry. I, I'm mad at myself for being angry. I'm, I'm trying to stuff that. I don't want to feel sad. I don't want to feel angry. I don't want to feel embarrassed. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that our emotions are our our compass. They're telling us if something is either going well or if something needs to be addressed. So when you, you know, when you have those kinds of thoughts, something triggers you in a relationship, that's your warning sign that, hey, there's something that needs to be addressed and worked through so that we don't get, you know, caught repeating the same thing over and over again. But it's going to keep coming up and visiting us until we figure out how to face it and deal deal with it. So think of your emotions and think of those triggers as your opportunity to grow and learn versus, oh, I've got to make a way. And I, you know, I don't mean to, you know, rat out on the, you know, the traditional me medical model and therapy, but a lot of times 
I hear you know, people who are going to therapists who are like trying to make them stop feeling the sadness or stop their anger or their pain. And that's not what we want. We want to really look at that and feel it and understand it and move through it. So I'll get off my soapbox now and turn it thank over you, to somebody. Cody. But you have, you have a great soapbox. So thank you for getting on your soapbox for us. I appreciate your soapbox very much. It, it was very helpful. Uh, Amy, I see you're off mute. Did you, were you ready to chime in? Yes, yes. I, I echo much of what has been said. And, and I will say that, um, you know, so I lost my virginity when I was 22 years old. And the guy that I did it with, I had fallen in love with him. And six months later, after we'd had intercourse eight times total, yes, I counted, I found out that he had a girlfriend he'd forgotten to tell me about. And he was sleeping with half the women in the city of Seattle because I was living in Seattle at the time. And when I found all this out, when I found all this out, it was either on the computer, on Messenger, or over the phone. We never had a face-to-face -face confrontation. Like you, would, you see these things in the movies and the TV. And so we never had that because he was just a coward. So I, I, I have not seen him in 15 years. Um, that was 2006. And so a few years back, fast forward to a few years back, um, I found out that he was no longer living in Seattle. He'd moved to New Orleans and I was in New Orleans for a conference. And I found out he was working at this bar about three blocks away from the hotel I was staying in. And so I still had this idea of closure in my head. Closure, I need closure, I need, because all these years had passed and I was still so hurt you know, by what had happened. And I was like, if we have this face-to-face -face conversation, then I can fully move on. And, and so I go to the bar and I walk in and from behind, I see someone kind of looks like him and turns around, it's not him. And I just asked if he was working that day and he wasn't working that day. And in that moment, I had this flood of emotions rush over me. And I realized with absolute certainty that there was no closure that he could ever give to me that I hadn't already gotten from myself. There was nothing he could do for me. Like closure is a mythical dragon. And I know dragons are really cool, but closure doesn't exist. Dragons might, we don't know. But closure is, is not something that can tangibly be relied upon. And I had to get that finality from myself. And, and the way that I knew I had finally moved on and moving on also was a whole other thing. I don't want to take up too much time, but I knew that I, I was finally having that closure as well was that I developed feelings for someone new, which I didn't think I'd be able to do. And then it wound up not working out with that person, but I was still okay afterward. And I didn't think that would be possible either. So that, you know, that whole, that whole closure, that all of that has to come from me. It was, you know, there was nothing, nothing that that guy could give me. Maybe there never was. And I had to learn that the hard way though, as I do everything. Maybe I, I hate to that. you, but he didn't forget. <laughs> he, he, he didn't forget to tell you, he's just a tool. Oh, no, no, no. I know he didn't forget to tell me. Yeah, I know. That's why he did it over the phone and, and the I, computer. I yeah, he's, a tool. he's not good enough for you. Not good enough for you at all. What a jerk. I, I know sorry. that now, yes. Yeah, I'm glad you know that now. I, I know I'm knowing now also that, that I got a ding, ding, ding on my alarm that said it's seven. So does that mean we need to come on and let them wrap up or do we continue well, with these questions? Why don't we let... A couple more people speak if they can go on the topic quickly, and then let's get to some questions and and finish okay. it up. Okay, I'll see because Mar uh, uh, Marina Kay and Marcel, uh, are, I think, are still the two that haven't answered on this yeah. one. And I'd yeah. love to hear from both of you if you have input uh, to kind of conclude this. If they'll give us a minute, <laughs> so uh, would either of you like to go next? Sure, I I can go. Um, I so for me, when I think of mindfulness as a late diagnosed cisgender female, I've always masked and I've always taken on the interests of my best friend or my boyfriend. So even now at my age in my current healthy relationship, I found myself doing what David's hobbies were, what his toys are, his music, his movies, where he wants to eat. And I've recently started to visualize myself as a four-year-old little four-year-old little girl and as an 80-year-old woman, and I want to be a role model for myself. And so I ask myself, how can I be a role model for those other me's? If it's hard for me to do that right now, how can I be a role model for my past innocent girl and my and my wise older woman? And advocate, self-advocate for myself. It's for some reason for a lot of us autistic people and with other similar profiles, it's easier for us to uh, advocate for being autistic or for our autistic friends 
or if you're neurotypical for your autistic friends or neurotypical friends, than it is to advocate for our own selves. And especially if you're part of a historically underserved community, as many of us here are. So being a self-advocate and a role model for myself is how I practice that mindfulness in a relationship. And also um, knowing that to catch those shameful messages. So if something happens and I'm having a lot of emotions and I'm starting to beat myself up with the shameful self-talk to recognize that and to not shame myself because I'm having emotions that I can't understand or that are overwhelming or that I'm holding on to for a long, long time, maybe years, maybe decades, that that's okay. That's the way I was wired. Um, so those, that's the answer for the question there. Thank you so much for that. Marina Kay, do you have any final parting words for us on this last question? Um, sure, I think I do. Um, so I, I just wanna tell everyone that the social clock is BS, it's fake. You know, and the, the, you know, the relationship that you're in or not in or whatever, you know, like if you're a parent, I, I used to listen to, and I still like them, all these, you know, love songs and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I internalize that. That's what you're supposed to feel like. It's supposed to be like, no, it's not. It's just a song. It sounds really beautiful. But <laughs> that's not, you know, you know, what you need to do what's best for you and do what's best for the person that's with you. And you will make your own happy and your own normal. I can't stand crowds. My husband and I, we don't go Valentine's Day, Mother's Day. We don't go anywhere on those days. Other people might be like, oh, I'm embarrassed. I don't have it. And you know, if I don't go anywhere, no. If Mother's Day or whatever, let's say Valentine's Day is on a uh, Thursday and everybody in the town is going to go out, then we're going to, then maybe we'll go the week before. I will go Monday or whatever. We'll do whatever. I, you know, we do what works for us. And if nobody, somebody else doesn't like it, you know, not for my last anniversary, he bought me an ice maker, the kind that makes like the sonic ice, like the stuff that has, he knows I love that for sensory reasons. And he went and searched for like the perfect kind with the perfect texture, you know? So it's like, I know, see, so thank you lyrics. See, like autistic people feel that, you know, when I it's told that to like, to non-autistic people, they were like, oh, you know, they're like, where's the jewelry? Where's the, the, I'm thinking, no, get me what I want. Get me my stimming toys. Get me the big fluffy pillows. Give me the foods that I eat. Absolutely spend money on me too. <laughs> you know, if you've got it, spend, you know, but I, I want to be, I, I want to be my real self. So be your real, you know, like whoever you all are, you know, it's hard. It's not easy, but you know, you're not any less of a person, you know, if for right now, if you're, you know, single, if it's taken a while to get to somebody. So if somebody hasn't been, you know, wise and mature enough to, to realize the catch that you are, that's kind of their loss. You know, you just keep being fabulous and being you and be, be fulfilled. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be with someone. And there's also nothing wrong with not wanting to be some, with someone. I know sometimes people are like, oh, I'm so worried such and such hasn't dated for a long time or has only dated a couple people or hasn't been in a relationship or such and such, you know, sometimes people are living out their brokenness in those ways, but sometimes there, it's just not the time. And what does it matter if it happens? Like, you know, like if, if someone makes this, you know, has this wonderful song that they compose and, and the rest of the music they've been making all their life was trash. If they, if that was their MO, then wow, what a legacy to have, you know? So it doesn't, you know, how, when everybody else gets married or doesn't or has kids or doesn't or lives together or doesn't or whatever, maybe you're, you're fine just being with you, you know, be, you know, but, but you have to own that and you have to know that and you have to feel that. Yeah. All right, Mike, uh, why don't you go through a couple of questions here for us and then we'll say our goodbyes and get out of here. Just to note, time. Mike, there was one I wanted to answer about love on the spectrum. I don't know if anybody else wanted to take it. Yes, I was going to make a note of that, actually. Um, okay. I, I saw you want to answer that live, so you can go ahead and take that one if you'd like. Yeah, if you want it, please. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say, so I have seen the show, and I agree with what the person who asked the question said, that they were giving kind of neurotypical dating tips to autistic couples, which I thought was a bit strange and ineffective. Um, but I also thought it was interesting there weren't any mixed neurology couples on the show either. It was either autistic, autistic, or autistic, other disability but there were you know, no autistic nor typical uh, couplings. But I wanted to share that I have spoken with the producers of the show. Um, I, I've been in contact with them and they're looking to do a US version of it. And I've expressed my interest in being not a participant on it, but a coach on the, on the show, being someone who's on the spectrum and that I might be able to relate more to where the participants are coming from. So 
just to let you know the producers have been listening and I'm hoping that you know the, the if the US version comes about that they'll take it in a in a different direction, a better direction. So just wanted to say that. Pretty cool. What You're else we got? amazing. <laughs> All right. And um there's one question here that I wanted to, to do. Oh, um, so when is the right time to talk to your potential dater about um your autism and the strengths and weaknesses that it comes with? I'll take that one. Um, I, I think it really depends on the situation of the person. I, I think for all of us here, based on what we do, you know, as being speakers and writers about autism, it's going to come up pretty early on because I know like in my situation, you know, I'm meeting somebody and they ask what I do. And I say, I speak and I write and I podcast. Oh, well, the next question is always about what, you know, and when I say autism, the next question is automatically going to be, what's your connection to autism? Well, I'm on the spectrum. So I think for us, it, it's got to come really quick. But I, I think that people need to realize that we are not failed neurotypicals, but we're perfectly created autistic people. And there's nothing to be ashamed of and no reason to not tell them very early on. Yeah. And, you know, I'll add that to, you know, you want to make sure, though, you are in a part where you know it is someone you can trust just in case uh you know because you know I, I being in different positions in your life like it's it's we're all out and open with this fact about ourselves because it's there's no danger to us to do that there's no harm in us like we, we've decided to put ourselves out we're able to do that but you know some people may not be able to be that open with that information for different reasons you know like i want to say i've known some parents like that have had this come up in custody battles so they keep that information a bit more protected and so your individual situation is not necessarily going to look like mine or jr's or anyone here uh you know, so you have to really take that into like what's your individual situation and you know how how safe you feel and how ready. You know, I, I wasn't as ready to talk about this when I was new in my diagnosis and I was still processing what that meant to me. So where you are with learning about what autism means to you can uh, be an impact on that too. Because when I first tried to tell people about what it meant that I was autistic, it was so bad, so not graceful. I did a terrible job trying to explain that I was autistic to people. I didn't know how to explain it and it never went well because I wasn't really ready. I wanted to share, but I wasn't ready to start sharing because I didn't know how to explain it yet. Uh, so, you know, I think that, you know, really can depend on your individual situation. But, you know, I, I would say uh, I, I share it with people who, you know, I think are my friends. Like, as soon as I know I trust someone, usually I'm willing to share that with them in a face to face. But I mean, all anyone has to do is Google my name, and I mean, it's out there. Like, I, I've been told it may be hard for me to find employment now because they cannot put that back in Pandora's box. So it's like, oh, shoot. I mean, there's real, real things to consider when you put that out there. It can have consequences. Um, That's where we're self employed, right, Larry? That I am self employed. <laughs> and we, usually I get a lot of callbacks, and I, I applied for like, 60 to 70 jobs as an openly autistic person and did not get any call back this time. So it does have an impact, which is sad to say. Yeah. Mike, what else we got? Say two more. All right, sounds good. Um, we have, okay, so sometimes um, neurodiverse conditions can make a person frantic and feel out of control. Um, I can imagine this makes, oh, where'd it go? There it is. I can imagine this makes dating such as I can such a person difficult. Uh, how can a neurodiverse person maintain control uh, to keep things together? Marnike, you want to take that? I actually would, I think I would like to yield for someone else okay. because I have an answer that I can't really phrase well. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to take that? I, I, I'll speak very briefly on that. So I am neuro, I could say neurovariant, and I am a blended neurovariant. I have many different um, conditions, ways of being. I'm dyslexic, dyspraxic. I have ADHD traits. I'm getting diagnosed for ADHD and OCD soon, um, as well as autistic and so forth, generalized anxiety disorder. So when I'm preparing to meet someone or date, it's it's pure agony. <laughs> it, it's terrible. Um, I think about it. I have anticipatory anxiety for days on end. I obsess about what I'm going to wear, how am I going to talk, where are we going to meet, what are we going to talk about, what are they going to be like, especially if you're doing meeting someone on online dating or similar format. 
So if, whether it's a relationship or just life in general, it's having the same tools in place that can help you in any situation when your anxiety is really heightened. So for me, that is writing, uh, listening to music, exercise, swimming, walking, being in nature, being with birds, feeding the birds, having a good friend to just process through it and having a place where I can transfer that anxiety and not the worst thing I could possibly do is be alone with myself and be alone with my thoughts and be alone in my head. So having ways that I can, someone mentioned, Richard mentioned about healthy, treating yourself healthily. So having healthy alternatives to um, distract me and get me out of that um, looping and worrying is very important for me when I'm dating. All right, Mike, one more. Yep. Uh, so this one, how do I know when I'm ready? Uh, I know I'm not yet, but how will I know when I am? Uh, I can't wait to be perfect because that day will never come. So how do I know when I'm ready? I think you, it's really kind of a feeling. I mean, you know, you, you think you might be getting close to being ready and you just got to go out and try and fail. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know the best relationships I've ever been in in my life are the ones that I wasn't necessarily looking for. I wasn't seeking like my current partner, like we were, we were friends, we were close friends, we worked together. Uh, and both of us ended up single around the same time. And neither of us was really looking to get into a relationship when it happened. But you know, we had a lot of great chemistry. And you know, I was helping uh, back then he didn't know how to use a computer. So I was helping him do a job search on a computer and teaching him how to set up a Gmail account. And you know, like, you know, just kind of helping my friend out. And then, you know, we were hanging out and it was just like a natural thing that happened. I wasn't looking for a relationship, you know, and it's like kind of funny because it's like they say uh, not to get into a relationship too soon. And we were both going through a breakup together. So it's like, I don't know that there is a right time for, you know, it's like not looking was actually what brought me right my right time and then you know I'll know I'll say that other times when I was looking more maybe getting a little bit desperate I was willing to get myself into relationships with people that were not good for me because I was like I need a relationship almost like trying to need an itch to scratch which is not a healthy way to go about it so I mean that that's just some of my thoughts from my personal experience like I don't know if there's a right time uh, but maybe uh, just making sure that you don't get desperate to the point where you're willing to sacrifice those 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 flags, those green flags, those red flags, those checklists that JR makes. You know, make sure you're not willing to like get to the point where it's like, okay, I'm going to forget my standards and my boundaries and throw that out the window, because um, then it, it's going to be a really bad relationship if you get into it with that in the beginning. I don't know if any of us are ever really ready. I think part of it is just jumping out there and going for it. And, you know, I think part of it is a lot of us on the spectrum do better starting like you did with that friendship first, because so many of us do really get attached and put a lot into relationships. And so I recommend working on those friendship skills and just going out, finding special interests, you know, things that you're passionate about, going and doing clubs or activities, things that you love to do that like make you feel fulfilled. And then you're going to be around other people who have similar interests and then building friendships. And then sometimes those friendships can grow into something else. Sometimes they don't, but you're still having that, you know, connection to other people, which is so important. I don't know which one yeah. was first. Amy, did you want to go? Oh, yeah. I just, well, I just wanted to say, like, so, you know, being about being ready. Um, so when I, you know, first started exploring my sexuality, I wrote erotic fiction. I didn't have normal outlets. I, did, I didn't, wasn't going on dates. Nobody wanted to go near me with a 10-foot pole. So I started to write as my outlet. And when the time came for me to have sex for the first time, I thought I was super duper ready. So I, I had, you know, done all this theorizing. I thought I knew you know, all these things, because I've been writing since the erotic fiction since I was 14. So here I was at 22. And, you know, I, I had the music burned on the CD. I had the outfit picked out I was going to wear. I, I had the bottle of wine all picked out. Um, I asked him to wear a white button down shirt because I always wanted to unbutton a guy's shirt when we we're going to make love. And I even 
I, you know, again, going back to that thing about I, I, if I screw up, nobody will ever want to have sex with me again. He'll never want to have sex with me again. I, I decided, I thought to myself, you know, when you stay at a hotel or you need a restaurant, they have these cards that you can fill out to talk about what your experience is like. So I made a sexual intercourse <laughs> comment card and, and, and it had, you know, totally dead serious, but tongue somewhat in cheek. And there are the questions on the back, you know, could you please rate the following, my outfit, my facial expressions, my vocal volume. Is there anything that happened that you'd like to have happen in the future? So on and so forth. And, and so, and again, of course, there's the inherent problem with that is that there's nothing about my pleasure or enjoyment in those questions. It's all about his, there's nothing about whether I was enjoying myself. But when the moment finally arrived and, and, and it happened, I, 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 what I wasn't ready for was the emotional piece, the piece I didn't know about, the piece of all the feelings that that would unlock. And so e even when you think you are ready, there are things that can arise that you're not going to be ready for because you've never experienced them before. And that's okay. We, you know, it's, 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 it's not possible to prepare for every single eventuality and every single thing that might come up in a relationship, but especially the, the feelings that are unlocked when they're so new like that, they can be overwhelming. Um, and, and it was for me, you know, I didn't know I was going to get so attached to this guy after I didn't know that that was part of who I was. I didn't learn that until then. So, okay. I, you know, I, I form an emotional connection when I have sex with somebody. And I also now know if I'm going to have sex with somebody, I need to have a connection already. I, I can't do one night stands. It's not, it's doesn't work for me. I need to have that intellectual and emotional thing there. So I didn't know all these things going in. I didn't know, you know, and I wasn't, you know, I, I, I may not have been ready for every single component of what I was going to in, you know, and end up experiencing, but I learned. And that's the thing is experience teaches us. We learn through the experiences that we have, and it's okay to not know everything right off the bat. Yeah. Thank so, you, Amy. Uh, I know. I, I think we'll let Marina Kay go. If she can, Marina Kay, can you keep it real quick, like one minute, super quick? Because sure. I know that you don't want to cut off. I think everyone else has, has spoke on this one, so I'd love to make sure we all get to uh, speak. Sure. Uh, I'm just we'll going to say that <laughs> kind of like what you were saying is, um, you know, like when I think about, you know, my marriage now, it was, you know, so on paper, we should have never worked. We were both right out of long-term relationships that were toxic. <laughs> um, I had told myself I was never going to date, a, 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 you know, a person of, of a particular immigrant background because I thought they were all sexist, you know, all these different things, you know, like, you know, that we both, you know, that shouldn't have worked. But again, it, I wasn't looking for it. Neither was he. And, you know, we really just kind of connected and um, we can talk even now, COVID-19, um, I think, you know what I mean? Like where people can't stand being around one another. I love seeing him when he's going to the kitchen. I'm like, wait, <laughs> like, you know, so, you know, I just think, I just, you know, just, you know, you, you won't, you won't always know and you have to be okay with that. Yeah. Hey, uh, I just want to say quickly before we go, though, if anybody does want to continue the conversation with any of us, um, you can go to the flyer on different brains or Twitter or their Facebook page. Uh, our contact information, such as websites, is on our little bios, so you can always find us and continue this further, just not tonight. Let us all have a break. <laughs> it's gotten dark. Yeah. It is. A dark corner now. All right, Michael, we going to take us out? Yep. All right. Well, thank you to our amazing uh, moderators and panelists, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we'll be sharing links and contact information for everyone in the chat box and on the screen. Um, from everyone here at Different Brains, wish you all a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.